Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the Beyond Train Podcast. I'm your host, Leah Dalton. Today, we're joined once again by another fantastic guest. Uh, so very grateful to have Dr. Marizel Arce on. Uh, our last episode was fantastic. Uh, it's actually my mom's favorite episode. So she uh, she absolutely loved it, and she loved you and your energy and everything that you had to say. It was And it was a fantastic episode. I really enjoyed listening back on it. So thank you so much for your time, and thanks for coming on again today. Oh, my pleasure. I look forward to our conversation. Awesome. All right. I got no introductory question for this one here. <laughs> so last time we discussed health, um, what that means. But uh, today we're going to talk about pleomorphism. And this is a really integral part of the train movement. You know, it's something that is underemphasized in the modern understanding Uh I'd love to hear maybe a little bit later about, you know, what the modern point of view is on it. But I think I just want to start with a little bit of an overview. I kind of want to give you the floor. Tell us what pleomorphism, pleomorphism is, what it's all about, what role does it play in health and disease. So I'll give you the floor and you can take it from there. Sure. So pleomorphism um, around the early 1800s, Bachamp was the first Pierre Antoine Bachamp. Uh, he was oh, he has so many different titles and he was a professor and a doctor and a chemist. Um, he discovered that the organisms, the microbes that we call bacteria, fungus, etc., cetera, um, they change shape. So he de- it, back then it was pleomorph or polymorph. It was something that had multiple forms, morph meaning the shape. Um, and he discovered this because he discovered uh, these what he called little granules, uh, little colloids in the body, in the blood of animals and plants um, by doing several different types of experiments, etc. cetera. Um, and he discovered that they were always there. They're, you know, and they change shape based on what's happening in the body. So he didn't get to really see because of the equipment and technology that he had at the time, he didn't get to see all the different various forms that these things that he delegated the name microzyma to. Um, but he understood that within our bodies that we have these little proto proto granules or colloids or whatever you want to delegate them as, um, that are maintaining our body that we work, we are symbiotic with it, um, and that they alter themselves according to their terrain. So from there, um, several other scientists um, throughout Europe um, discovered his work or was doing similar work alongside around the time when he kind of was kind of waning away in terms of his prestige and his research and things like that. Um, there was an Ernest Elmquist. Um, he actually worked with Robert Koch. Um, if everybody knows the Koch's postulates, right? So uh, Ernest Elmquist actually had 21, research, uh, 21 years of research of studying pleomorphism. He, he was a little later on. So his microscopes, his technology was a little bit more advanced than Bachamp's. And he was actually able to see based on looking at one bacteria, for instance, he would put it in this, this terrain or that terrain. And by terrain, I mean, environment, the, the environment with which it, it thrived. So it would, he would take some sort of bacteria, put it in one environment, change it and put another environment, change that again. And he was able to kind of pleomorph different organisms in different ways in, in so many different ways. And he actually, there's a great quote from him. I don't know the exact quote, but it's something to the effect of that. We'll never really know all the various forms that these proto proto granules or microzymas uh, inside of us will create. Um, because again, when we look at them in lab conditions, we're creating these finite little bubbles of life, right? So you're looking at, um, let's say, for instance, you're putting it on a Petri dish that has a certain kind of gelatin or agar on it, and you're having a certain temperature, um, and you're feeding it certain type of broth, right? It's And back then they did like, you know, a, a literally broth, like a, a beef stock or a chicken stock or something. Um, 
and then changing the terrain in maybe in a more negative way by adding certain chemicals or things like that. So they would watch it change based again on all the different variations that they did. They created variables to kind of map out what was happening with each organism. Um, and in doing that, again, you're creating finite conditions and Almquest, Dr. Almquest was able to kind of go, well, we'll never really know because of the body being so dynamic and changing and environments. There's so many different types of micro, you know, environments within us that we'll never really know all those different types of things. And then you have, um, and, uh, Gunther Enderlein, who was able to also map out in his own way. And he designated these, um, proto granules, these colloids within us, um, protids. Um, and the, in the protids, he watched again, using his microscope and understanding, cause he was a, um, a bacteriologist and a zoologist. So he, he, uh, he used the microscope extensively, um, and he was able to see and literally kind of constrict the, the changing in, in, in a certain way that he can actually watch it change in a more uniform way. So one of his greatest works that he created was called the ba uh, bacteria cyclogeny. He wrote all about it. He researched it and he was able to see it go from these granules within us to more complex granules. So now they went from protids to symprotids. And then, then again, you have various forms. To, so it's not as simplistic as people think, although in order to explain, you have to simplify it to a cycle, like a simple cycle, but it's not that simplistic because out of one comes many and out of the next group comes many, and you can kind of diverge in different things. And he had all sorts of names, chondrites, thesets, spermits, you know, based on their morphology. Um, but essentially he went from these, these slightly more complex, um, granules to long forming filaments. And then the filaments eventually would create more complex structures and you would see bacteria. And then sometimes the bacteria would lose some of its features and create its more, get, get bigger, if you will. And they'd be mycobacterium or fungus, depending upon which cycle you start to drive down. <laughs> so there's all these different things, but he was supposing he was actually theorizing and then watching his theory come to fruition that as the terrain becomes more imbalanced or more toxic, if you will, your the body is looking for more complex com complexity to, to rid itself of this imbalance, rid itself of the toxins. And so the, these little beginning specks that you would see, let's in a dark field microscope, for instance, they become bigger and bigger and do more complex things and be capable of more complex things. And their excretions, right? Bacterial, what they call endotoxins, exotoxins, uh, you know, enterotoxins. These are not toxic to us. These are excretions to tell others what to do as well as kind of almost help the terrain change and morph and, and almost feed those feed the, the system in understanding what it needs to do so that there's more excretion. So these are not toxic to us. There's nothing that's toxic to us. It's all about recreating the balance itself. Um, and, and many people to, you know, even to this day will, will fight that whole idea of pleomorphism, even though you can, if you have a simple microscope and have a dark field condenser, you can watch it, like take your own blood, put it there. And as your blood dies over the course of, if it stays hydrated, that's the one thing. Sometimes they, your blood dehydrates after 24, 36 hours. But if you can have a certain amount and it still stays hydrated, as the blood decays, you can actually watch these complexities start to form. It's very, very interesting. But many people fight that idea because they're, how did bacteria get into fungus? Well, if we really understand um, the, the forms with which that they're creating, you can break down those forms into those complex different uh, systems that they created, right? So the filamentous ones that are coming from the beginning, that filamentous structure actually starts to become more like a membrane. And that membrane is now the outer feature of the bacterium that you see. So it's, it's really, it, it's a matter of a lot of what I call monomorphous. So monomorphous are the opposing structure, opposing ideology to pleomorphism. Monomorphism is the idea that there's a multitude of 
bacteria, infinite amount of bacteria, um, infinite amount of fungus, mycobacteria, things like that, um, and that they don't all stem from one source. Um, and that's, again, that's more, it's, that complements the germ theory because the germ theory is all about you get something, you catch something, right? So then you have this um, solution system, right? So you have a problem, someone's going to offer you the solution. Monomorphous are the same way. They don't realize that they're feeding into that same system because if I have this bacteria, I need a solution for that bacteria, a solution for that bacteria. And the multitude of bacteria and fungal infections that I may have, I have to have all these separate, you know, treatments uh, or answers for those problems. When in fact, if you understand pleomorphism, Although I have to say, Gunther Enderlein and, and many others like Lyda Matman, who studied cell wall deficient forms, didn't, um, because they had to, to reconcile the germ theory for themselves, never really completely understood that pleomorphism in itself cannot be contagious if we are already doing it to ourselves. Like if we, if I am making a toxic terrain, I, my microzymas, protids, whatever, um, again, Gaston Nessens also in, in Canada studied them and he also created his own cycle and called them somatids and Reich saw them and called them bions. We can go on and on. Everybody has their own name for them, but I'm going to stick with microzymas. Um, and so if you understand that the microzymas are within you, outside of you, everywhere, it doesn't matter. Um, if your terrain is off, the, they will cycle to whatever position they need to cycle to, to help rebalance the system. And when their microzymas are in the dirt, they become whatever organisms are necessary for the soil to be healthy and balanced. They become the mycorrhiza in the roots of trees. They become the soil bacteria we, we know to be in the soil. Um, and they're not harmful to us. So you can eat, you can put dirt in your mouth. You can eat, we, how many times we've eaten root or tuberous uh, plants and there's mycorrhiza all over. They don't harm us. You know, there's no such thing as harm. Bacteria don't harm. Fungus don't harm. They don't harm us. They're, they're just going to be in our system. And if they're useful to our system, then they're going to do a job in their, our system. If they're not useful, they're either broken down or they are excreted, whatever it may be. So um, pleomorphists like Lyda Matman and Gunther Enderlein were germ theorists and created the pleomorphic structure to reconcile the germ theory. So they would say after a certain point in the cycle, uh, as the microzymas became a more complex, they would call them pathogenic. And they would say, oh, now they're, they're more virulent and they're going to create disease. When in fact, they're not creating disease, they're just being hosted in an environment that's causing them to do a stronger job to get rid of the imbalance. I mean, that's, we can go more and more and more, but I feel like that kind of sums it up just a little bit. Absolutely. That's a beautiful uh, way to put it. Great introduction to the topic, I think. Um, you mentioned, um, you know, the microscopes. And the listener will remember our discussion with the Bagelson brothers, of course, and we discussed dark field microscopy. Maybe a quick rundown, because they're not looking through electron microscopies at these microzyma or these organisms, right? So it's dark field microscopy. Maybe you could just have a word on that. Sure. So a regular light compound microscope right, that has a regular light condenser, you just change out the bottom part and it's called a dark field condenser. So what it's doing is it's, it's pinpointing light to be reflective, not on the back part. So when you're looking at it, like if you look at images on a, um, on a screen, when they show on TV or in books, the stage or what you're looking through behind when you're looking at bacteria organisms, it's white. In a dark field, the condenser is concentrating the light so that the only thing lit up is the things itself, you know? And so the, the, the background, the stage is actually black. Um, and this gives, uh, the light is now reflecting off anything that's on the slide that's not the actual, uh, whatever liquid or substance itself is on the, the slide. Um, and in doing that, 
we get to see life. We can see, see a lot of different life in, um, in the whatever sample that you're looking at in the microscope and it's alive. There's, you're not adding stains, you're not adding chemicals. Um, you're not adding anything to it. You can, you get the blood, whether, you know, be pinprick from your finger or, you know, if there's phlebotomists out there or anything, you can just get blood, put it on a slide, put a cover slip, stick it in. You're not putting oil. It's not an oil immersion type of thing. Um, it's not the electron microscope where you're growing it and subjecting it to all sorts of chemicals and then sticking it in a resin and bombarding it in a vacuum um, or freezing it. Um, it's literally straight, the blood straight on a slide, right into the microscope and you get to see life. Yeah, so you're seeing it in the live state rather than staining it, fixing it. And even in light microscopy, staining is a common practice. So like looking at dead tissue is a very common practice. Often you don't not looking at live uh, blood. You know, I remember in my introductory bio classes when we did look down the microscope, I never looked at anything in its live state. And you'd think that would be the first thing that you sort of do in biology is look at something that's alive rather than something that's dead, but that's a whole other issue. Um, and so with this dark field microscope, you know, this is where we're seeing these microzyma, right? Like they're little specks in the, in the background almost, and they're buzzing around. They have little Brownian motion. They're moving like all over the place, you know? Um, and you know, Bichon, might not have known about the cyclogeny or the maybe the development, the specifics of the development of the microzyma, but he did do really interesting experiments with fermentation, you know, where um, he was able to, you know, isolate the variable, the microzyma, and um, he was able to produce ferments with microzyma present and no bacteria present, and was not able to produce ferments without any microzyma present. So, um, that's sort of the almost evidence from the beginning and a very basic, um, you know, experiment that proves so much. I think that's, that's so interesting, but these microzyme, you know, something that was confusing for me for a long time that I'd love to hear your perspective on is like, you know, for a while I was confused. I thought are microzymas viruses, you know, what are, what are we seeing? Like this whole idea. Okay. We know that, Obviously, viruses don't exist, and the methodologies, the cytopathic effect, plaque assays experiments create obviously these, you know, little vesicles that we call viruses. We know that that's been falsified, but in the dark field, you know, what like is was there any confusion there ever in the history of microzyma? I'd just love to hear your your thoughts on that. Maybe I feel like it might be a common question that's asked with with the microzyma and pleomorphism. Well, that's a, that's a really good question, and many of us have pondered that 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 question itself. Um, are we seeing potentially in electron microscopy the suspension of a microzyma? Are we seeing them in action as they go in and out of the cell, doing their function? It, it's a possibility. It's a total possibility um, that we are potentially looking at some of these these structures these uh, protein structures, colloid structures, whatever you want to name them, um, as they are suspended in the resin, as they are suspended in doing their actions, we potentially are um, looking at their function. But the, the narrative behind what is being seen is more of, the, more of a uh, deleterious aspect of it. Right. So when you have scientists looking at potentially these structures, which I've seen, I don't know if you know who Jamie Andrews is and many of the people who have been doing um, the, the experiments to show that they're finding similar structures in non-viral, uh, quote unquote, non-viral samples. Um you know, one wonders if potentially that what we are seeing is those microzymas in suspension doing their job. The problem is, is again, we are now steeped in germ theory, contagion theory, um, contagion ideology more. Um, and that now when you're seeing these things cross the barrier going in and out, you, you can't undo some person's understanding of, well, it's going in and out of a cell. How do we know it's not you know, 
it's floating around and now it's going to come in and out of my cell. So for me, my, I always resort back to it's could, it's a possibility, but at the same time, it, it really doesn't matter if what we're catching, what we're doing is catching them in the midst of doing their job. They're doing their job because at the end of the day, you've just destroyed the medium and context with which these cells were being, were, were living, right? You know, we can go back into that electro microscopy conversation, but we don't have to because we understand that it's a non context, right? It's non natural. Just like I, I, just like when Ernest Elmquist said, we can find all the various forms, but we'll never know all of them because the moment we take something out of the body, it's not what actually is happening in the body. So it, at the same time, yeah, I, I, I can, I can. I can agree with some some contentions that quite possibly what we're looking at is a microzyma in action. When we look at micrographs, what we think is a virus, but is it in a true form that is again what's inside of us, right? You can you can also have the contention that it is the cells exploding and all the heavy metals and the stains and the fixatives. It's the cells are trying to expulse before they were suspended in the resin. So it could be as simply as that, like th that's what a heavy metal expulsion looks like in a vacuum, a vacuum type, you know, removal space, which they've labeled exosome. Um, so it could be various different things happening, but again, it's not, it's not in a natural context, you know, it's in, it's in a lab concentrated chemicalized context. Yeah. Great answer. And you know, I think it kind of begs the question because then again, it's like, what evidence do we have outside of electron microscopy for these contentions, right? And, you know, Harold Hillman has done some fascinating work that the yes, yeah. methodology to set up an electron micro, like a, a you know, a image on that level, the staining, the dehydrating, the placing in a vacuum, uh, freezing it, rehydrating it with some sort of resin. And all of this alters the, you know, the cell wall. We're not like, you know, there's a lot of really interesting work um, Gerald Pollack does in, you know, even our understanding of this uh, lipid bilayer as the walls of the cell, it might be much more gel-like in nature. And, you know, I think he's sort of getting closer to some sort of representation, some truthful representation of what's happening in the body. But, you know, to theorize about what we're seeing under the electron microscope alone is, I think it kind of leads to nowhere and it's more so just for fun than any sort of actual scientific yeah. endeavor. So, <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's, it's fun to kind of think about stuff like that sometimes. Uh, you know, I'd really love to hear an example of pleomorphism, maybe sort of in this understanding of like modern species, right? Because we, we do have this need as humans to sort of categorize things. And obviously, you know, the, through species and genus and sort of this whole understanding of classifying organisms in general, you know, we've separated, you know, a streptococcus from a listeria and, you know, we, we've isolated all this and fungus is on this tree and it's all based on genomics, which is a whole other discussion, obviously. <laughs> um, but, you know, even even getting to like, what evidence do we have beyond genomics? We have, you know, these shapes and oftentimes these shapes are confused in modern science. You know, they could say that, oh, well, the E. coli is taking the shape of a helicobacter, right? And so, you know, it's the it's a similar shape. So we need to use serology or genomics to confirm this process. But then again, how valid are those methods beyond, you know, it kind of becomes one big circle again here a little bit. Um, but maybe I, I know they've used so like there's so much different terminology, but maybe an example, if you, if you could, uh, might help listeners kind of understand how it develops in the body to, in response to any sort of sort of stress, disease, heavy metal type thing like that. Sure, sure. Um, well, I want to just touch upon you said something really important about stains, right? And 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 fixatives, and we've talked about that briefly. But it it's really really important, especially like you said in the light compound microscopes, they actually use stains, right? We have to remember that many of the scientists, and I'm reminded by an article I was actually just shown by my husband um, a couple of days ago about how this year the doctor who discovered 
H. pylori, Heliobacter pylori, died. And when you read the article, there's a very interesting sentence at the end of the first paragraph, which it talks about how the only way he was, he had patients coming in with, you know, gastric issues, and he wanted to discover why they were all having these gastric issues. So he created a stain and he was able to see H. pylori. So you have to think about that now in a very logical way. Now, if our microzymas are pleomorphing based on their terrain, when he created a new stain, he created a new environment, which means he's going to see a new organism, right? So do we actually have within ourselves H. pylori? Or do we have something happening where there's an imbalance, they take a sample of our blood or a endoscopy swab or whatever it is that you want to do. They take a specialized stain and they create H. pylori with their specialized stain, right? So even our context of what we understand, all these different organisms within us that we supposedly have, are they actually there or are they being created by the various stains that have been created to see them. So aside from that, pleomorphism happens all the time. We witness it happen all the time, right? We ourselves, we don't realize it. We actually, in our own way, pleomorph. We're born in a certain structure. We're grown, we pleomorph. We're not staying baby-sized and we don't look the same when we're older from a baby. I don't look like what I look like when I was born. So my body has changed shapes. I've lengthened. I've, my looks change. Everything starts to change. Even my organs within me change and alter and vary their structure. So in a way we all also pleomorph. Organisms like a butterfly, where does a butterfly come from? A butterfly pleomorphs, right? It comes from a, being a caterpillar, right? First it's an egg, then it's a caterpillar, then it's in a pupa, then it's a, a cocoon eyes, and then it turns into a butterfly. Frogs, tadpoles, the tadpoles now have limbs, limbs now the tail comes off and they become frogs. We, ple we have separated the idea that certain organisms change form and we're okay with that. But the idea that other organisms that can do certain things within us change form is, oh, that's just, that's completely aberrant, right? So if you look at, let's go back to the tadpole and the frog, what the tadpole consumes and what the frog consumes is completely different. The environment with which the tadpole lives and the environment that the frog lives is completely different. So now we're looking at a completely two different structures. They, you can't swap places. They can't eat different. They, they need their specific environment to thrive. And that's the same thing with our microzymas. They need a specific environment to pleomorph into what they need to do. So let's say, for instance, here's a great one. You have a quote unquote bacterial infection. Let's say strep throat, right? And the first thing that people, doctors are given is an antibiotic. Now, we're not talking about the age old penicillin of penicillium notum that was first discovered by Alexander Fleming. We're talking about the chemical stuff and I'll, I'll, I'll go back to why I make that a specific. Well, let's talk about the chemical stuff. So the chemical stuff, they give you a chemical stuff, all of a sudden you start to feel better. You feel better not because, oh, you got rid of the bacteria, which it may look like you did, what the antibiotics do is now suppressing your symptoms of whatever is happening, right? The itchy throat, the, maybe a little bit of a fever, malaise, whatever it may be. The antibiotics suppress the symptoms. You just created a slightly more toxic environment. Those bacteria went away, but what happens to people when they take antibiotics, especially people who are can consume a little bit more foods and there's a little bit more gut stuff happening. What happens? What do they tell you? In order to prevent this from happening, you take a probiotic with your antibiotic. Fungal infection. 
Now, why does a fungal infection happen after taking an antibiotic? Why is a fungal infection always secondary to a bacterial infection? Because when you had your bacterial infection, which it wasn't an infection, it was the streptococcus doing their job, breaking down the decayed degenerative tissue in, in your larynx, pharynx, wherever it is in the back of your throat. That irritation will, will warrant that streptococcus to do its job. You get rid of that streptococcus, that irritation, degeneration, whatever is now not gone. It's still there. But the symptoms, the pain relief is gone because the antibiotics make your body think, oh, it's gone. Now your body's toxic and you have a problem. So the body goes, okay, pleomorph, because again, a lot of that, those antibiotics cause more acidity in the system, especially where it shouldn't be like in the blood. And the body goes, okay, bacteria, now the job needs to be even done even more efficiently and needs to be done with stronger organisms. So now we're going to go into fungus form and the fungus form now is there to get rid of the toxicity and to help resolve whatever irritation, uh, putrefaction, uh, fermentation that's happening in the system. So there are various ways that we can create pleomorphism, but we, or that nature creates pleomorphism. We're just not aware of it. Now back to Alexander Fleming. And the reason why I wanted that as an aside is Alexander Fleming, if some people don't know, he discovered penicillin because on his Petri dish, he noticed that there was an organism that killed off the bacteria on his Petri dish. So he's like, oh, I found something that is potentially for bacterial infections. Now, what he didn't realize is that the bacterial, the Petri dish with which he, he had it was basically dying, right? That broth, he didn't feed the broth. He didn't feed the bacteria. The bacteria were starving. They were in an environment of complete decay. So now they had to pleomorph into something that would actually be able to survive this disrupted environment. And penicillin notum was actually created by the bacteria that were sitting there. So they, fungus are stronger. They survive a more toxic environment. They're able to um, thrive and survive to help break down whatever it is so that whatever is broken down, unfortunately, a Petri dish is not a good example because everything's broken down and then their niche is gone and then they'll just turn into basically dust the way Antoine Bachamp saw everything turned back to dust. But in our environment, it would be like in our bodies, you'd have this type of fungus breaking down the broken down tissue. And then all of a sudden fungus would dissipate, bacteria would show up. If you don't need bacteria, then the fungus would dissipate and everything would start to go back to the microzymal maintenance forms. Amazing. You know, I think what I want to add here is the concept of bioremediation you know, because this is something that you can look up and read in the literature too. And it kind of ties into what we're talking about here. You know, when uh, Dr. Arce talks about this, like the it going from a bacterial stage to a fungal stage and the fungus being more efficient, you know, I think what you're getting at, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but is that it's, it, it, it there are increased bioremediation in the environment. So it's generally understood if you study any sort of soil microbiology, environmental microbiology, um, you know, really on the environmental side, this is well understood in also in aquatics, like in fish, we understand that parasites and fungus have played this bioremediation role rather than this infection role, right? And so what I mean by this is that, you know, they can consume and absorb high concentrations of toxicity, heavy metals, pesticides, environmental toxins of all kind. Um, so when you develop from the bacteria, the bacteria have this property as well. They can clean environments like I believe listeria is associated with cadmium. You can look up some really interesting different um, connections between specific heavy metals and specific species. I don't know how valid and you know it necessarily is, but there is a little bit of that out there. Um, 
but what we're seeing is that bacteria can play this role where they can clean up environmental toxicity stored in their tissues at higher concentrations than our tissues can store it, right? So you're going from a lesser concentration, very concentrated in the bacteria, even more concentrated in fungus and parasites as well. So they are cleaning that environment up. And then of course you might excrete a parasite at some time, right? That generally makes a lot of sense to me. You're getting rid of that. You know, you may not see a fungus get excreted through your GI tract or bacteria get excreted through your GI tract, but it's similar mechanism. It's coming out of your body at some point, right? So um, and these obviously are in high loads of, of toxicities, right? So this is the concept of bioremediation that kind of takes place and that it needs to increase over time. The other interesting thing that I want to add, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on, is like uh, uh, the listener will remember back to our conversation with Paul Linders when we discussed cancer. Cancer is often associated with a fungus, right? And so we also discussed with the Biggelsons homotoxicology, the development of disease. Um, you know, the later stages of diseases, the cancers, et cetera, are fungal you know, there is fungus there. It's not an infection. It's not caused by a fungus, but it's because the fungus is there cleaning up an extremely toxic environment and you're in very late stages of diseases. So I'm sure Dr. Arce would agree that symptom suppression is one of the largest factors that play a role in the development of these diseases, right? Because our acute illnesses, when it's in the bacterial stage, you know, it's not as toxic and then it gets more and more toxin, this toxicity, this damage, this disease has to manifest eventually. Uh, anything you want to add to, to any of that or correct? Uh, no, no, it's, it's good. Um, with cancer though, it is not, so sim the simplicity, when we talk about the, the cycle, going back to that cycle, it's, we want to we want to simplistically say at the end of the fungus is the cancer and for many many years i thought bacteria fungus cancer right but when we look at it when we look at the blood when we even look at the ph of the blood cancer is actually in a more alkaline environment than acidic environment and so and and i can attest to that because how many people have done fasting and we've seen cancer actually start to disappear. Now, when you fast, you're actually going to metabolic acidosis. That means that your blood is actually uh, lower than 7.35. When your but you want your blood to be higher than that, to be in balance. But when you fast, when you truly fast, not the fast when you kind of drink milk or fast when you do broth, but like literally fast, water fast, you go through metabolic acidosis and cancers disappear, which means cancer can't thrive in an acidic environment. So my, my theory, again, because I can't see inside the body, right? So I base it off of what, you know, patients, clients, I see patterns, right? And I'm, I'm on the same page as the Biggelsons when it comes to that. Harvey Biggelson also has it in his books um, that it's all about patterns. It's all about seeing what's happening. And we can see these patterns as best we can, you know, when a person talks about themselves and their symptoms and things like that, we can see those patterns in the blood, but we'll never really truly understand the body by means of in a lab, you know, and all those stains and everything. So the best thing is patterns. And with those patterns, with that understanding, cancer to me, if it's in more alkaline versus acid and the cycle in order to get to fungus is acidic, very acidic, suppression to me is cancer, right? So your body, let's say for instance, your body has heavy toxicities, right? Malnourishment, and it creates such acidity. As it's going through, you keep suppressing it. It wants to go bacterial, you keep suppressing it. You want to do fungus, it keeps suppressing it. You keep suppressing it. And the body wants to be acidic to get to that point of getting those fungus to clean up the, the, those heavy metals, to clean up those toxins, to get that junk out. But you keep suppressing it. The body can't become acidic, you keep making it alkaline, eventually you'll have the pendulum swing to too much alkaline because now those toxins, those heavy metals create the, add to the alkalinity of the body. And that's where you get the cancers. 
that's the patterning that I see. Very cool. Yeah. You, and, you know, I feel like that, that was exception when I sort of got into this, like, alternative way of looking at things was that cancer was always acidic. It was always acidic. And I think it was the Biggleson's that I learned from. It's like, it's not always an acidic state. So in this pleomorphic cycle, do you see it go more acidic with these organisms growing? Is it always going towards a state of, of acidosis? Is that like a pattern that you see? Um, it's not acidosis per se. It's more of just like the body's imbalance and it's creating more acidities. You have more acidities in the tissue, you know, just the blood is a slightly more acidic, but metabolic acidosis, um, you know, you don't get metabolic acidosis per se. You just see that the balance is often it's shifting to the acidic, acidic side. Um, again, you can, you know, we have various tissues within our body that some tissues like it more acidic, some tissues like it more alkaline. It's just a matter of understanding that certain tissues need to be in the specific pH that they want to be, right? Blood has a specific little window. Your stomach has a specific little window. And when we start messing around with that by, you know, doing alkalizing diets or consuming foods that we think are alkalizing or not acidic, you know, doing all that type of stuff without understanding the, the, the vast different environments that we host inside of us, you're going to actually feed the body to do more work. And, you know, at the end of the day, you're going to think, oh, I'm, I'm making fungus happen or I make, no, you're just creating this imbalance and you're going to have these guys expend a lot of energy, a lot of your resources to try to get it back into balance. Amazing. Yeah. Thanks for clearing that up. That was really helpful. I think. Something that I, I did want to add to that I thought of earlier there, kind of getting back to the discussion of pleomorphism, not that this is outside of that discussion, but, you know, it with the, like in the modern understanding, with our, our understanding of bacteria and bacterial species, you know, it's really important if you're going to sort of look into this stuff that you see, okay, what what is the evidence that we have for these different species too? And there's a really interesting problem that's very well admitted that I learned in all of my micro courses you know it's very well known in, in academia and um, and it's called the great plate anomaly you know the culturability problem uh, and this idea is that you know we can only culture less than one percent of known microbes right so in the laboratory right of course, I love that Almquist quote that you say that, you know, we'll never, we can never mimic the human body in a Petri dish, right? It's just, it's not possible, right? Maybe there'll be technologies down the road where we can see inside the body or in the live state. I don't know. I don't know if I'd even want a part of that, <laughs> but, um, you know, we can't create the body in a Petri dish and we can't create 99%, more than 99% of the environments needed to grow these bacteria that, which we claim exist and you know, that we study. And it's really interesting because it's like, you know, there's a certain amount of information that you can get from a cell culture experiment, you know, but if you can't culture the microbe, where are we getting that information from? You know, that's a question that I kind of always ask myself. I'm like, well, if we can't even study it in the lab, where are we studying this? In the computer? <laughs> you know, in our theories? Are we just completely theorizing about this stuff? Is it all based on our understanding of genomics and you know, it's, it just kind of, it escapes me, you know? So I wonder if you have any thoughts on that. Um, you, that's, that's absolutely what I've pondered. You know, it's, it's, it's hard because when you, when you first, when you first jump in to trying to understand cell biology, microbiology, pleomorphism, you know, you don't put that filter on. You put the filter of, oh, they figured it out, you know, with all the cell culturing. Like, oh, they've, you know, and it's just a matter of we need to do more. We need to do more. But then when you take that filter off and you start to kind of see outside of the scope of what we discussed earlier, like, we can, we can try to figure out how to culture whatever, but we're never going to actually mimic the body. I mean, unless you want to put, like, cut off my arm and, you know, just see if we can kind of cut it open and kind of see what we can grow inside of it. 
you know, but even then it's not attached to me. It's not circulating. It's not doing, you know? And even if we were to host, like, you know, how back in the day, the antiquated idea of doing vivisections, right? Trying to do uh, experiments with live animals, you know, that are cut open, but still alive. You know, you're putting the animal under duress. You're taking the animal out of, out of the environment, exactly, out of the environment um, with which it lives. You are completely subjugating the animal to conditions that are not natural. So even though the animal is alive and we're going, oh, we're peering inside the animal to see something, we're, see we're still not seeing truth. We're not seeing the it that we're trying to discover. You know, and funny enough, vivisections, it always brings me back to Claude Bernard. So Claude Bernard is the one that discovered the terrain was everything. The germ is nothing. And he discovered the terrain is everything by way of vivisection. So he's, he's like my not favorite, you know, scientist. He's kind of like cool that he discovered the terrain thing, but he's like not my favorite scientist. But look at how he had to discover it, right? Because he had to discover it going well, I'm not going to understand terrain in a Petri dish. I'm only going to understand terrain in, in a live animal. So in that, re in that regard, because of that disgusting, <laughs> disgusting method, he was actually, he determined that the terrain is everything. And when you take that discovery that the terrain is everything, everything in a Petri dish is kind of moot, you know? I mean, I know there's a, there's a, there was a Dr. E.C. Rose now in the Mayo Clinic back in the 1930s. Not to be confused with Rosen, no, who did contagion um, uh, experiments, but Rose now, R O S E N O W. Um, he actually, in the Mayo Clinic, there's countless studies of him doing where he would, um, like, pleomorphic, uh, you know, transfers. So in context, sort of with the body. And I say that it's sort of, because he would take a strep that was grown on a Petri dish, blood agar. He would take the streptococcus and he would transfer the streptococcus onto what would be considered uh, like a, a clear agar or a broth agar. And then within a matter of 24 to 36 hours, he watched the streptococcus transform under the microscope into Staphylococcus aureus. And he did it back and forth several times. He took the staph, he put it on a new fresh agar, blood agar, and he turned it back to strep. Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So I think he did it like over a thousand times. But the point being that he was able to do it, there was no stopping from changing. It was an understanding that we, supposedly discover strep, right? Streps in our throat, right? Where staph is on our skin. But now you have to think, what did we just discuss? Are they discovering staph on our skin? Or are they just happening to put whatever they find on our skin in the agar that staph would grow? Is strep really in the back of your throat? Or are you getting swabbed? And then it being grown in a blood agar. And because they supposedly understand the acidity or the, um, the protein structure of the strap, they do those fast tests where they swab you and then they put it in this little thing that has like this little opening and they do it and it says a plus or a minus and then you're positive for strep or negative for strep. Okay, fine. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you have strep. It's just that these are protein structures that are intrinsic in us. So are these protein structures, what are they measuring in that rapid test then? Are they measuring the microzymas that are now changing into more complex forms so that they're actually just measuring those protein structures? So it's fascinating. It's just fascinating me because you, we have to step outside of the, we know what's going on because it was done in the lab. You know, it's, it's, it's a really hard, like it starts going, then your mind goes because you're just like, oh, okay, then I don't, I don't understand anymore. And that's where you have to be to really learn. You have to go, okay, let me dig deeper. Let me figure it out. Let me understand it. Let me do it myself. Let me set up a lab and do it myself, you know?
Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And like, you know, these confirmatory tests, you know, we don't have to get into it, like, because we, I've kind of done a <laughs> talked a lot about it before and we had Jamie Andrews on there too a couple weeks ago and you know but when we're talking about antibodies tests you know antibodies are non-specific this again is like as admitted as it gets in the literature they don't want to admit it but there are companies out there that their sole purpose is to try and improve the specificity uh, the specificity of antibodies and antibody tests because it is one of the largest sources of the reproducibility crisis in the literature is serology, is the use of antibodies in research. And th like, make no mistake, medical research is at the top of this. It is irreproducible for the most part because a lot of it relies on these antibody tests. If you're really interested to see if you took a bunch of staff like in a petri dish and tested it for strep throat i wonder what the results would be <laughs> you know because what i see with these antibody tests like that covid antibody test anybody that was sick was testing positive whereas the you know the pcr test was kind of more random based on the number of cycles that it was run on but the antibody test the antigen test i should say was it was just anybody that was sick of any, you know, there's no way to distinguish whether it was this microbe or this microbe or this, whatever, you know, based on the germ theory nonsense that they provoke proposed. There's no, there's no evidence. There's no scientific process to it whatsoever. So that's a really important thing to understand. Um, I think one of the last things that I want to ask you about is, is parasites. And just to be clear, I feel like we might be getting a little redundant here, but what, how does parasites fit in into this pleomorphic cycle because you don't really see nasons talking about it when you see his little 16 step process you you know maybe some of the other guys talk about it like uh i i'd just love to hear your thoughts of maybe you know has it been mentioned what role does it kind of play is it in that cycle eager to hear your thoughts well parasites let's let's just separate what a lot of people call parasites so you i have patients coming in going i have parasites in my gut and so people mistaken having fungus or yeast or, or or bacteria as parasites. So parasites are parasitic. Bacteria and fungus are saprophytic um, and mutualistic. Um, parasites are like helminths. Parasites are like um, you know tapeworms, pinworms, that type of thing. So I just want to make sure that we're using the same words for the same things, right? Um, so parasites, um, they are essentially we want to say on the more complex end right i've never seen myself in on a slide on a sample turn something turn into like a pinworm or an amoeba or paramecium or anything like that but i suspect that if again just like in a petri dish i suspect if we give the right type of environment and host the right type of you know everything everything just climate everything you can probably create a microzyma to turn into a helminth, into an amoeba, into a paramecium, whatever you'd like. Um, and I think a lot of that is hosted outside in our environment, right? So you have pinworms, tapeworms, um, hy like hydra, whatever it is, you have them outside because you have these complex environments outside. And they are specifically seen in environments that are take fungus, you were talking about fungus and fungus being able to double its weight or triple its weight, or even more than that in consumption of heavy metals and, and toxins and, you know, all sorts of pesticides, things like that. Helminths can do like 1500 times their body weight in heavy metals or something ridiculous like that. So you're going to see them in those type of environments. So if you're like a bear, right and they always talk about this what like uh if you've ever seen like i think it's like a brown bear or you know they they have pictures of you know these strings coming out of the the rear end of a bear and everybody's like oh, well, how does he have like he's healthy he's, he's in nature he's yeah but we don't at this point now we don't know how toxic and heavy metal the filled the water is of the of the fish that he's consuming endlessly right and those helmets are there coming out of him because he's built up all this toxicity, all those heavy metals, 
we have to forget our nature, our nature is not as natural anymore as it used to be. So you're not, you know, you fresh fish from the Long Island Sound, you know, like it's yay, you know, that's, you know, whoo, that's not as natural as you're going to think it's going to be, you know, and, you know, and we have to, we have to put those, we have to put our thinking caps on and go, okay, if the environment with which these organisms thrive, if our environment is that, if you're that toxic, and now we can go to really sub, subpar third world countries where they're constantly consuming low, very low nutrient dense foods, that their water is very sickly, that their, their environment is very sickly, that the conditions with which they then with, with, with which they live in is, is just so, so not hygienic, you know, no fresh water, no clean air, the dirt, the soil is just infused with whatever pesticides corporations do. And, you know, especially we're looking at Africa, um, South America, Central America. I mean, we can even look in, in the conditions in some of the, uh, like even Wuhan, right? Wuhan was like a, a completely industrialized. They were, they were growing fruits and vegetables in literal waste products from the up, upstream factory, right? So to find these pinworms, tapeworms, you know, filamentous type of helminths um, in Africa, in people's bodies, you're looking at a very toxic body. Now, whether or not they got it from the environment or they created themselves at this very point to decipher that is, you know, it's like chicken or egg because both environments are toxic. So did they catch the worms or did they create the worms? Well, I don't know because they're eating the food that's toxic and their body's already toxic because it's an intoxic environment. So I, I truly believe, yes, we can get to a point where the pleomorphic cycle creates these super complex organisms. We just might not see that specifically in the body in that slow progression it has to be a very toxic environment and you know people who go let's say hunting for instance um or camping amoebosis like they'll, they'll find amoeba in their sinuses or you know they'll take a trek to to africa on safari and they'll happen to get a tapeworm or some sort of other worm um Again, you have to look in your environment. What are you consuming? You know, is your body already in the toxic overload state? And now you are now overloading it with more infiltrates of toxics, pesticides, what have you. And so they're going, those organisms, those helminths are going to thrive. Um, I think it's just an important feature to, to just realize that at that point, when people talk about parasites and want to argue, well, do you catch it? Well, then you, there is contagion. Or are you making it? I think at that at point, it's a, it's a kind of a complementary structure. You're you are now becoming your environment as toxic as your environment. So whether or not it's in your environment or not, or whether or not you've created it, it's just the same. It's the same thing. Yeah, amazing. I, and I I completely agree. You know, whether it comes down to you're catching it or you're developing it, the, you know, in my opinion, the important part stays the same. You know, it's that if you have toxic body, your body will either develop or hold on to these things that we're exposed to. Um, but the requirement is the toxicity in the body. It is the diseased environment. Um, and, you know, like my kind of understanding, too, is is that our internal environments are depictions of our external environment. So if we're in, in an environment that's extremely toxic, and that includes, you know, the food you eat, the air you breathe, the the habits that you do, the people you are around, things that you consume on a mental and spiritual level as well, these are all going to affect that that terrain. And so if Absolutely. you're in a toxic environment, your internal environment will mimic and represent that environment eventually. I kind of take that sort of understanding. And so uh, I think you, I mean, you raise a good question there, but it is kind of chicken or the egg. And at the end of the day, again, it doesn't really matter when we're going to talk about healing um, you know, it comes down to, to cleaning the environment and, um, that's, that's kind of it. And, you know, I think, um, just a comment too on, you know, like the third world countries now is where we see these, 
you know, like diseases proliferate, like these infectious illnesses proliferate. And what we forget in our ivory towers in the West and the, in the first world countries is that when we're done with something, we send it to these other countries and all of our waste goes there. All of our metals are, and you know, like you can watch documentaries on YouTube. You can go to and watch people in Africa. They, they burn this scrap metal. They're aerosolizing these heavy metals and it's extremely toxic and these rubbers and these synthetic plastics they're burning these things because it's their livelihood they're trying to make a a living and they're going through scrap metal and stuff but you know there's a absolutely insane amount of individuals that are doing this i mean look at india where do you think all of our ddt went when we decided we're going to stop using it it all went to india and guess where polio is it is in india even though ddt is banned they still use it in really high quantity so you know, it's really important, you know, we're like to, to kind of look at these things. These are uncomfortable truths, obviously, you know, that's why it's important to sort of live a, a life, you know, if we are going to live in the West, you know, try to minimize your um, consumption, especially of single use items and, you know, trying to, I mean, do things like recycle if you, if I mean, I know the recycling uh, whole system is kind of <laughs> a sham too, at the same time, you know, like we just ship it away. That's kind of what recycling is. Um, and we just say, you know, deal with this, you know, to different countries, you know, we don't actually, but, but, you know, trying to reuse things like, like even like in your own accord, like reusing wood or reusing whatever it may be, you know? So, you know, it's, it's our responsibility on today too. And, um, I mean, it's an uncomfortable truth. And I think it's just something to, to consider, you know, when you're thinking about, you know, why are these diseases in these these other countries that we don't see them here well you know their environments are extremely toxic because of the practices that they're using and understandably so you know they're trying to make a living and trying to get by the best they can and anyways that's kind of what i got there <laughs> uh dr i say do you have any final thoughts on the episode anything you want to add that you think you might have missed about pleomorphism or anything no i think i think i have a quote from not one of my favorite people but it's a really good quote and I think it sums up what we were just talking about, because I feel like we really highlighted the fact that we will, what we can see is still just conceptualized by what we can try to do in a lab. So this quote is actually pertinent to that. I didn't memorize it, so I have to read it. Um, Until man duplicates a blade of grass, nature can laugh at his so-called scientific knowledge. It is obvious that we don't understand one millionth of one percent about anything, and that's from Thomas Edison. Wow, I think that's beautiful. Wow, great way to end the episode here. <laughs> that's fantastic. I never heard that quote before. That's really, really interesting. I love it. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and I'd also like to share maybe some links or social medias or where we can find you and learn more from you and your beautiful message and your amazing insight. You know, how do we find you and your work? Well, I have a website, terraindoctor.com. Um, I'm on Instagram as dr.marizelle, M-A-R-I-Z-E-L-L-E. And I'm on X as D, doc, uh, Dr. R-C, so D-R-A-R-C-E. Um, and I think from the last time I said a book was coming out and a book is still coming out. We're still working with it. Um, I'm still working with my editor on it cause I really want it to be, you know, something that people can it, just like our discussion, but I want it to be as palatable and simple. I don't want to get into too complex things because I think there's a lot of people out there just on the fence trying to learn this stuff, but still that indoctrination still is in their ear. So I want it to be something that people can kind of use as a, a go-to guide when someone asks them a question of why is this happening? So it's taking a little time, but it'll definitely come out. And I'm sure it'll be well worth the wait too. Um, I love the amount of literature that's coming out now on the terrain. There's been some really great books coming out recently. I think we're heading in a fantastic direction. And, you know, this is also simple. You know, and keeping it simple is important too. You know, we tend to overcomplicate things. And, you know, I hope this discussion, we avoided that, you know, but sometimes when it does get complicated and specific and technical, you know, you don't need to go that far, you know. So keeping it simple, you know, we've understood health and wellness and how to thrive. We've understood this for a very long time. Um, and, you know, if you want to maybe learn more about that, you know, I think our last episode, we did a pretty decent job covering that sort of stuff. So go check that one out too. And, um, all of our episodes here are 
tie into the same idea. So Dr. Arce, thank you so much for coming on again today. I so much appreciate your time. This has been a fascinating discussion. I learned so much and, and I just love this topic. So thank you. My pleasure as, as always. Awesome. All right. I want to thank you all for listening. You should all know this is not medical advice or scientific advice. <laughs> this is for your informational purposes only. But also remember that we're all responsible, sovereign beings capable of criticizing, thinking, and understanding absolutely anything. We, the people in the greater forest, set together self healers, self governable, self teachers, and so much more. Please reach out if you have any questions, criticisms, comments, concerns. Instagram, probably the best way to reach me. You all know that, though. Love all your messages, all the feedback on the episodes. They keep me going. I, I just love it. I love hearing it. I love chatting with you guys. You guys are so much smarter than me and you guys teach me so much every single day. So I appreciate you all for taking the time to listen in and uh, just everything that you guys have shared with me over the time. And yeah, we're going to keep pushing, keep going. I love doing this. So, and I love all you guys. Thank you very much. And if you do enjoy this and found it informative, give us a like, share, comment. Sharing is the best way to to support us and, and get this word out. Um, I think this would be a great episode to share. If you're going to share one, this is such a cool topic. All right. That's all I got. Remember, there are two types of people in the world. Those who believe they can, those who believe they can't, and they are both correct. Thanks for listening. Take care.